Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Welcome to Whitehall. Nice to see you. Gosh. We're glad to have you here. Yeah, beautiful. Have you ever been here before? No, never been here. All right. No. Well, I will enjoy showing you Whitehall. Golly. All right. Your name is Mary. Yes. My yeah. name is Nancy, and I'll be your guide today. Yeah. And this was once part of a farm that was 96 acres. So it was a very large uh, piece of property in mm -hmm. the day that I'll be describing, which is the 18th century, 1729, oh. when the Barclays moved in here. Very early. Yeah. Mary, you probably realize this isn't the typical country house oh. for uh, 1729. It has this grand doorway, which is one of the unique things about Whitehall. Mm -hmm. It is Palladian style, mm -hmm. and many people say it's the first use of Palladian style in America. It was popular wow. in London right. for the people who came over to uh, embellish this house with that. It had developed in Rome in the century before, in the 17th century, by the architect Palladio. That's why it's called a Palladian doorway. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about it? Well, I noticed the, um, the ionic influence the, on a, yes. the columns. Yes, and it's so like a little temple, isn't it? Is correct. These yeah. are actually called pilasters right. when they're put against a wall. Yeah. And the little pediment it's like you're going to enter a very significant building. Mm. Uh, the other unique thing about this is the door is only half a real door. This is here for the grand door. Right. And only the right half is going to be the real doorway. This is a fake and it extends the room inside further so it can be a larger room. Mm -hmm. But it's here for show and it does a wonderful job. All right, Mary, here we go into Whitehall. Before we go further, I want to talk about this portrait, which is called the Bermuda Group. The original is in the Yale Center for the British Arts mm -hmm. in New Haven. Mm -hmm. And it's a very grand, large portrait. This is a photo reproduction of that portrait. It shows George Barclay, the famous philosopher who lived here for two and a half years, starting in 1729. His wife, Anne, mm. baby Henry, who was born here in this house. Gosh. Mm. <clears throat> uh, Smybert, who is the artist who painted this picture and came with uh, George Barclay. The reason it's called a Bermuda, the Bermuda Group is that this was a project to take a college to Bermuda uh, for the education of colonists and Native Americans. And we have Smybert, the artist, and these two people who were to be faculty members at the new college. Miss Hancock was brought as a companion to Anne Barclay, who was coming to this strange land. And we can tell it was compiled by, uh, from sketch, sketches by Smybert, because this gentleman was back in Ireland and never came to this country. He uh, w must have been done in a sketch before they left mm. Ireland. All right, I'll shut this door, Mary, and we'll walk into the other room where I'll ask you to sign our guest book. Thank you. This probably was used as a reception room even in the day of George Barclay because it makes sense to come in here right away. And if we could ask for a donation to help keep uh, Whitehall going, our usual, oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very good. We need to keep our old building going. Old buildings need constant maintenance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so this would have been used, we, th we think, you know, from a distance you have to 
uh, guess what rooms would have been used, but as a reception room and as an office for right. writing or for keeping accounts. The maps really tell the story mm -hmm. in this room. Before I talk about the maps, I'm just going to say a word about the pronunciation of his name. Mm -hmm. Because in this country, we say Berkeley. Mm -hmm. You know, you've just turned in Berkeley Avenue. Yeah. And you have Berkeley, California, which is actually named for this man. Wow. Because he was the father of higher education in America. Now, mm -hmm. uh, his name at the time and in England today would be pronounced Barclay. Barclay. So I have been taught to say Barclay. Mm -hmm. As a philosopher, he's known as George Barclay. Mm -hmm. As an English clergyman, he is known when he comes here as Dean Barclay. He is Dean of Londonderry when he comes here. Oh. When he leaves, he becomes Bishop of Cloyne. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I say Bishop Barclay because he died as, like as a bishop. Yeah. Well, this map is a map, an old map of Ireland from the time when he came here, from the 18th century. And of course we have Ireland and England. And he does spend quite a bit of time in England, but the early life is all in Ireland. He's born down in this region in the Kilkenny area, mm -hmm. and he's educated in the Dublin area. He, uh, is sent to Trinity College mm -hmm. and he spends time there not only as a student but getting his uh, ordination mm -hmm. as a clergyman and then he has a career in charge of their library which is a fantastic library at Trinity College yeah. and does a lot of his early philosophy writing while he is a young young man at Trinity College. If we could look over here for a moment, this map is of Bermuda, which was his destination for starting the new college of St. Paul's. Now, the funny story is that he never got to Bermuda. <laughs> and his uh, proposition to start a college there failed because of funding. Mm -hmm. It's like not getting your grant. Why did he choose Bermuda as opposed to being somewhere in this country, the college? I mean, why Bermuda? All right, that is the question. Why Bermuda? Yeah. It appeared to him to be an idyllic paradise, mm -hmm. a place to, for a utopia, mm -hmm. because it was untouched by civilization in any way. He really believed that Western civilization was becoming very corrupt. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, even wrote a poem about it, uh, about westward ho, the course of empire goes. And America was to be the fulfillment mm -hmm. of God's wishes for mankind. Mm -hmm. And they were leaving old corrupt Europe. Was this was one of his themes. Was he training or having the college to train ministers, people for the ministry? Exactly, oh. yes. He was thinking of this as a place where Native Americans oh. and colonists could wow. be educated together and become Christians, the Native Americans, and if they became clergy, mm -hmm. they would be wonderful for spreading the gospel within the United States. Oh. So that was part of the United States. It wasn't the United States yet, it was America. That was part of his thinking. Right. And the college, uh, the only uh, sign today that this ever existed, there is a boys school in Bermuda called, uh, you know, the Barclay School. Oh, nice. mm -hmm but the college never took place. Now it is thought that very soon after his arrival in 1729, he changes his mind uh -huh. because he senses there's going to be turmoil in England and there's going to be trouble with funding this 
strange idea to have a college in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. So it's thought that by uh, early or mid-1730, he's shifted to thinking this is going to be the location. Uh -huh. And if you think about it, Brown is founded during the next uh, 30 years or so after mm -hmm. he leaves. Mm -hmm. So actually, Brown is the fulfillment in a way of him trying to bring more higher education to this country. Mm -hmm. When he arrives here in America, he first goes to Virginia and he visits William and Mary, which already has a reputation as a very good school. Mm -hmm. And Harvard and Yale have started. Columbia is going to be started a little later. I mean, maybe five or six years later mm -hmm. in New York area. Mm -hmm. So he's right on the cusp of trying to promote higher education in America. Now, Mary, let's walk across the room and look at another map. On the way, we'll notice this furniture. You know, none of the furniture is actually the furniture that Bishop Barclay brought wow. with him. I was wondering. Uh, yes. It is furniture that has been acquired by the dames or is on loan. This desk, I think, is on loan from one of the preservation organizations in Newport. Mm -hmm. But we have a lovely clock, which is ours, which is, was made in Dublin, we found out, oh at the time yeah. of their departure. Oh. All right, well, let's look at this map. This is a map of Italy from... Uh, the 18th century when he would have traveled there. We see some interesting pictures of Vesuvius. He traveled in Italy as a tutor to a wealthy young man. So he was hired after his time of writing and being the librarian at Trinity College to be a tutor or a guide for the Grand Tour. And actually his um, time in Italy was just, he really enjoyed. You can imagine learning. That's where he learned about Palladio and the architecture he would use for the front door. His favorite part was said to be Apulia, the boot heel uh, part of Italy. And uh, he said on a good day, this area reminded him of the best of Italy. Right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So he he loved the loved out of doors yeah. and beautiful scenery. Yeah. All right, let's shift over here. This is the uh, reproduction of the original deed which was signed to give him this property. Mm -hmm. And he huh. uh, came here and he asked for a significant amount of acres. He got 96 acres which would give him a farm to raise food for the people attending the college. Mm -hmm. Now, how did, where did he get the money for that? All right, he had some money before he left Ireland. Uh -huh. He had, but he didn't have all the money he uh -huh. needed. He was expecting a grant of maybe 28 thousand pounds from Parliament uh -huh. and this was opposed by Walpole and it, and the King changed and all sorts of significant right. things happened yeah. so uh, he he never got the money he needed to actually put the whole thing into motion but he had enough money to feed um, his family and build the, the house the build the house wow. and by the land? And by the land. You know, philosophers aren't the most practical people. <laughs> so he probably, I, I get the idea, the money was usually there. And he went ahead with his life. Would his, his wife possibly have helped? Yes, and her father was the Lord Chief Justice in Ireland. Oh. So, um, yes, she had some money, which might have helped him. Yeah. And he still received a wage as the Dean of Derry oh. in Northern Ireland hmm. in the Anglican Church. So the people who owned this property were the Whipples, Sarah Whipple and her husband. 
and Sarah was the sister of Abraham Redwood. So the Redwood family knew Bishop Barclay, uh, or Dean Barclay as he was. And uh, in the deed, it mentions a dwelling house on the property. That means that there was something here before Barclay took this house over and mm -hmm. made it into the grand house it became. Mm -hmm. A house worthy of a college president. Right. That's another reason that we think maybe he had switched his idea to having uh, yeah. the college here in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. All right, now Mary will go into this hall and by the way, this is another stylistic uh, characteristic of the Georgian style, which he was bringing by adding this addition to the front of the house. Actually, the part that Barclay added begins here and is the forward part of the house. This central hall is a Georgian idea to have this almost is spacious enough to be another room. The new, early Newport houses, like the Wanton Lyme and Hazard House, mm -hmm. you'll open the front door <clears throat> and there'll be a stairway right there going upstairs. So to come back here gives a little more spaciousness before you go upstairs. We have portraits of the time. He might have brought prints like this to hang on his wall of people he knew in London. <clears throat> he knew Addison and went to the plays of Dryden. Oh, and here's Steele. Addison and Steele had the newspaper of the day and were famous essayists, oh. essayists who wrote for the, uh, their newspaper. We have a map of the time of the American Revolution. This is the Blaskowitz map. <coughs> what happens when Barclay has to leave is that he deeds the property to Yale University. The money from uh, the rent that Yale will get for renting it out will be uh, used for scholarships for people studying for the divinity mm -hmm. school, divinity for the, for the career as a minister. So he, uh, that is the origin of the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale. Mm -hmm. Once again, we go back to Berkeley because that's what we say here. But Whitehall, at the time of the American Revolution, was known well enough that it has a circle around it right there on the Blaskowitz map of the 1770s Whitehall is mentioned and circled. So Whitehall is a well-known property. During the rest of Whitehall's history after the American Revolution, it was rented to a series of farmers who used it as a farm. Mm -hmm. And this went along until probably about, well, let's say the American Revolution happens, you know, 1776, it ends 1780. And by 1780 in the hands of farmers, and 1775, the farmer needs a bigger house and a more modern house. So for about a hundred years, oh. it is a farm. Mm -hmm. And it goes through several families mm -hmm. and it ends up with the Brown family. Mm -hmm. And the farmer, Abraham Brown, builds the house at the end of the street, mm -hmm. which a lot of people think is Whitehall because it's white. <laughs> Whitehall happens to be red, mm -hmm. but uh, that farm, when it is abandoned for the new white spacious family farmhouse at the end of the street, Whitehall becomes abandoned. Mm -hmm. And these photographs are from that time when Whitehall is abandoned. 
it has vines overgrowing the uh, wonderful doorway and actually they take the doorway off the hand carved pilasters and the pediment and store them in the attic. It's very uh, good they did because in the 1890s they're going to be found and put back on. So we think we have that doorway even though some parts of it had to be uh, repaired drastically. Mary, you haven't seen the back of the house yet, but this wonderful cat slide roof, which is very, very long and covered with shingles. This is a famous photograph because it is commissioned by Charles McKim of the uh, landscape firm, McKim, Mead and White in the 1870s. This is shortly after the Civil War has ended. Mm. And he commissions this photograph because he is inspired by colonial architecture. He's going back and he's saying, isn't this wonderful, the skin of shingles which covers this whole back of the building. And this photograph is one of the first to be published in an architectural magazine that is uh, printed in New York in about 1880. Well, it's ironic, isn't it, that they take the back of the building to be interested in rather than the Palladian doorway. Yes. They don't care that much about that, but McKim, Mead, and White will be the initiators of colonial revival and the shingle style. So Whitehall, hmm actually is very significant not only in colonial times but but in architectural history mm -hmm. it helps to inspire the major movement of the late 19th and early 20th century wow. so it's very interesting the other point is that uh, the spirit of restoration and preservation is prominent in the United States. In the 1850s, Mount Vernon was one of the first houses to be restored. Yeah. So with the first anniversary, the centennial of the American Revolution in 1876, you got a lot of interest in preservation and patriotism. And the formation of the colonial dames takes place in the 1890s. Wow. And they are the ones, the ladies, who become very concerned about our own uh, historic building here on Aquidneck Island. And they, with their own money, get hold of the property from the farmer. They don't realize, I don't think, that there's this whole tie up with the lease from Yale, but they get hold of the piece of property and then with their own money they restore did they put, Whitehall. Did they, did they restore the door? They did. Well that's possibly why um, McKean, McKim, that um, they didn't uh, do the front because it wasn't restored. Yet. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, that's a good observation. Yeah. So they really mm -hmm. pressed it back up. Let's move over oh, here now. Gosh. So Mary, here we see the opening, the formal opening of Whitehall to the public, July 26, 1900. And so they've finished the restoration. You can see there are a lot more trees in the front yard. Uh, they are listening to a speaker, a famous speaker, Edward Everett Hale giving his address to salute the colonial dames for their patriotism and preservation um, heroism. And it is open to the public for education about American history, mm -hmm. which is one of the goals of the colonial, the National Society of the Colonial Dames mm -hmm. of America. So we have uh, people standing here, at first we thought they were guests, but we've determined that those are the coachmen waiting for their uh, bosses who are listening <clears throat> to the distinguished orator. 
Now, Mary, we'll look at what we have designated as Bishop Barclay's bedroom. Once again, we don't know the exact uses of the room, but uh, we uh, had a, uh, wanted to have a bedroom on this floor. One reason is because we were given this marvelous bed mm -hmm. from actually even earlier before they came. You know, uh, all the furnishings in this room are British and would have been earlier, so they, they might have been things that they brought with them. Uh, one of the dames, uh, one of our members, embroidered this beautiful, cruel work uh, curtains, which uh, are in memory of her grandmother, and they're really a beautiful, beautiful tribute. Beds were covered in those days to keep creepy, crawly, spiders from falling on you when you slept, but also for warmth. Warmth, yeah. Uh, the fire was the heat, and when that wore off in the early morning hours, mm. you'd have had some heat kept in by the curtains, sure. and also for privacy. Yeah. This actually was an inn for maybe five or ten years and it belonged to the grandfather of Gilbert Stewart, our famous portrait painter. Um, so we also think of that with this room because the paneling, the wonderful paneling at the end was added in that period after Bishop Barclay had left. This piece of furniture is very interesting because it's the type of modular furniture which they could bring over from England. This divides into three parts, and this would hold your clothing, your bed linens, your supplies, and it could then be a reassembled where you went. Actually, there's a chest over by the door that is part of this same assembly, so you could uh, modify it. And the piece in the corner opposite is called a Varguenio. And this is a Spanish desk with many little drawers that is made to go aboard a ship. I will demonstrate how it might be when it went to sea. This part could be folded up. This part, the hasp, come down and lock it. And then there are handles on either side for carrying it like a chest onto the ship. It is sitting on a stand that was specially built for, her, for it, but this was your 18th century computer because it has all these little sections where you can file away your papers and be as organized as possible. And you can carry this along with you wherever you're traveling. So it was a traveling desk. Above the desk, we have little engravings done about Bishop Barclay after his departure, a portrait of him, a copy of a portrait. And on the right is a picture of Bishop Barclay sitting in the hole underneath hanging rock. It said that he could walk down there a mile away and do some of his writing. And he actually wrote a book while he was here on Aquidneck Island called Alsafron. Alsafron was a very, very interesting debate about religion between several people. Mm -hmm. And they were walking on the beach, and there are other uh, scenes of Aquidneck Island which are told about in the book. When he returned to London after his project fizzled out, this was published about 1731 or 32, and it was actually quite a, uh, it wasn't a bestseller, but it was a credible, credibly popular with his, people who liked his writing. Remember how I said that um, this room had been part of an inn, yeah. and people would have stayed here for a number of uh, years. It was an inn. 
Well, this secret compartment dates from when this paneling which was installed, which is the time when it was an inn. And it belonged to Anthony, who was uh, Gilbert Stewart's grandfather. And what was this used for? It actually becomes very secret and disguised uh, from, or not noticeable, especially if this door is closed. So if, if I were the innkeeper, I'd put the money in there. Yeah. <laughs> but there's an article in here about it could have been stored, they could have used it to store a valuable book like the Bible or a, um, they're valuables. I haven't been speaking about the tiles in the rooms, but these are early English tiles, which are quite significant and quite lovely. They may, probably were not uh, brought by the Barclays, but they are um, very stylish for the time. We also see an antique bed warmer and a foot warmer to take with you in a carriage, and the cradle of the time. Anne Barclay had several pregnancies while she was in this house. The first one, Henry, the child lived and uh, actually lived to be an adult. Uh, she had two miscarriages, and her third child, the, the final pregnancy, there was a lovely little girl, Lucia, born, but Lucia dies right before they have to go back to London. So only one child is born in America of their surviving children. Mm. Lucia, little Lucia, is buried uh, next to Nathaniel Kay in the Trinity Burying Ground. Right by the church. Yes, no, right by the church. Born, yeah. It's marked on the gravestone of Nathaniel K. On the edge is carved. Lucia Barclay was buried here. There are a few descendants of uh, Berkeley, not lineal descendants, but um, yeah. off to the side from his brothers or his, anyway. Uh, Occasionally people will come. One uh, lovely person visited from Australia during the last 10 years wow. who was a descendant. Great. Now, Mary, let's enter the old kitchen. And remember how I said that the grand part that Bishop Barclay had built in 1729 was added on to the front of this building. So actually, we may be in the original dwelling house now. The basement looks a little different. We've never had this proved, but I think this is the heart of the colonial building. If they had something here that they could stay in uh, for a month, it would have helped them with building the front part of the building with bedrooms and so forth. But here, they probably would have had a loft, but and there is evidence that there was actually a staircase over on this side, which would have led up to a loft, mm -hmm. and it would have been a small two-room dwelling. Mm -hmm. We're very lucky we have the colonial fireplace. We have this wonderful uh, working, cooking fireplace, such as they would have had in uh, 1729. It has a bread oven on this side with the uh, big shovels or pan that would be used to put the bread in and out. And I have learned that, you know, these fireplaces, you would not have a roaring fire that did the cooking, even though that appeals to us. You would have a number of low fires or even hot coals mm -hmm. that produced a lot of heat. You'd get a good fire started early in the morning and then that would be nurtured all through the day so that it could cook a good supper. We have a uh, spit 
here in a concealed uh, reflective oven, which could be put to do meat near the hottest part of the fire. We have a crane that projects out and you could hang of uh, your pots and your griddle along that to take advantage of small fires underneath. Uh, various, uh, a soup kettle and a bellows, a bellows for adding oxygen right. to the fire. Up here on the above the mantle, we have a rifle that was very, uh, Early, an early rifle, uh, very controversial when it was first hung up because some of the dames said, oh, we shouldn't hang a gun because Bishop Barclay probably was a pacifist and wouldn't have had a, a shooting arm, a, a shooting piece firearm. in a firearm in the house but it's a very beautiful piece and it has been hung there despite the controversy. And I'm sure the farmer and the innkeeper might have had a gun. Yep. So we do have things that were gifts to us that we used. Is this a powder horn? It is. Do you have other questions at this point? Oh gosh. Um, I was wondering with this uh, did they put coal in the bottom of that, or did they just push push it, do you think, near the fire? I think it was put near the fire, and it would reflect the oh. heat on the meat. Did she have any help? I just, I'm thinking of... Very good question. I mean, being pregnant and losing children. Yes, and the, all the housekeeping of a new oh country. I mean, she'd had servants in, in Ireland. Yeah. All right, it, there is a record that they had three slaves. Oh. All right, and that would have been normal mm. for 1729 yeah. in this uh, colony. In fact, if you know about the local history, Rhode Island was part of the triangle trade, yeah. which made rum here, took it down uh, to the uh, West Indies, mm and then uh, was traded for slaves. So we were part of the triangle trade. Uh, oh, the sugar cane, it was taken down there. Mm -hmm. It actually, it worked the other way around. The rum was taken to Africa. The slaves were taken down to the West Indies. They loaded up with sugar cane. They brought it up to Newport. It was made into rum. Yeah. All right, a time uh, we are now trying to realize the flaws and the faults and the sins and the problems that occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the more valuable things in the room is the spice cabinet, which has, once again, like in the other room, little drawers to keep track of things and it could keep spices such as nutmegs, you know, nutmegs like we use in eggnog and cake, but it also could use medicines. And if we're in the garden, we have a part of the garden which is developed, devoted to medicinal herbs. So you might have something which could be harmful, which would be right. locked up here to keep it away from children and people who pilfered things because they were valuable or they wanted them. We also have this wonderful table, which I've seen used with, for many parties that the dames have. The dames continue in this, century to be active and to be, uh, as I am, <clears throat> volunteering to run and help Whitehall. But this table t comes apart so you could easily carry it. It has pins wow. that come out yeah. and uh, 
the table comes apart into about five pieces and it could be carried outside for a big picnic dinner. Mm -hmm. Again, I will remind you, Mary, that none of these furnishings did belong to Bishop Barclay. We have just acquired things through the years, during the hundred years the dames have owned the property mm -hmm. and furnished it as best we could appropriately. Mm -hmm. And they might have had a grander table mm -hmm. than what we see there. Yeah. Let's go into our large room now. Later this would have been called the withdrawing room or the drawing room but in a colonial house it would have had many uh, functions this could be where they'd sit in the evening mrs barclay and barclay on the chaise if she were uh, especially if she were pregnant or needed to rest um, they could also entertain in this room Perhaps, you know, it was the age of wonderful music. Maybe they even had a little musicale here, or if it were a bad winter's day and they couldn't drive into Newport, they might have had a church service here and invited the neighbors in or people who were staying with them. So many, many uh, functions in this room. It would be wonderful if these walls could talk. Oh, yeah. I'll say that the portraits are not of the Barclay family. These have been gifted to us, and they actually are the Brinley family of Newport who are uh, shown in those portraits, and they are colonial portraits, mm. so we're lucky to have them. Mm. And Mrs. Barclay, she might have brought a family portrait with her. Mm. All right, I wanted to mention these tiles. I mentioned the uh, tiles in the room that was an inn, and show, or the room when I spoke of it being an inn. These tiles are very different, and I really hope someone someday will write a little paper about them. They seem to be Irish Delft. I have a book about Irish Delft. So in my mind, this is something the Barclays might have brought with them in 1729 to embellish their new home. They are almost uh, Asian in their feel of Chinese landscape with the, uh, there's a river bank shown here and the painting of the trees. It's very, very uh, lovely. They are what inspired the women. They're said to have entered this room, which chickens and pigs had been running around, and the floor was all littered with dirt. But in the ashes on the fireplace, there were pieces of these broken tiles, which helped to inspire them. And they, uh, they were actually uh, helpful in inspiring the restoration architect Norman Isham in the 1930s to do a restoration of this room and he used this green color to choose the green color that you see on the wood woodwork in this room, which is a lovely color. All right, let's look at the clock. Since we're dealing with re restoration and reproduction of pieces. This is an early reproduction of a clock that Henry VIII is supposed to have given Anne Boleyn as a wedding gift. And it was uh, copied probably in uh, the 1800s and we have it. It's actually called a bracket clock because you have to have a little bracket built for the clock to sit on. It uh, has a pendulum weight which is running the clock and if you examine the clock it only has one hand. They thought in uh, the time of Henry VIII around 1500s uh, that you could judge you know, if it was half past uh, five, the clock 
hand would be halfway between five and six. And we have underneath it a backgammon game or AC Ducey, which is of the period. Wonderful game that you could play today. Mary, at this point, maybe you're a little curious about how this man was a philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, George Barclay did do some groundbreaking thinking that is still studied today, and some people call him the uh, sort of the watershed moment between early earth philosophy and later philosophy. He was uh, he was inspired by the works of Locke, and so he, he had studied philosophy, and he also was very sincere about his calling to the Church of England mm -hmm. ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so both those things figure in his philosophy. He is born about a hundred years after Galileo uses the telescope, and the first use of the microscope. Okay. So our perception of reality is changing because of science and technology. We can see things that are bigger than we ever thought possible, like the stars, and things that are smaller than we ever thought possible, which are invisible to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. So his mind works with that and also works with not giving up on religion and his perception of God. Mm -hmm. So his, his, famous, his most famous work is about the perception of reality. And most of modern philosophy is based on perception, perception of reality, not on uh, ideals or, uh, you know, things that are preset reality, but a reality that is based on our own uh, perception. Mm -hmm. So this is really begins to describe his philosophy. And after his death, someone thought up the verse that they, we quote in all sorts of things, or the line, uh, he asked the question in his mind, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there, does it make a noise? Once again, the noise and the person are necessary to the reality of the tree falling. Mm -hmm. So he is ahead of his time in thinking these thoughts, and more modern philosophy will be based on his perceptions about perception <laughs> and illusion. And that's why I think that front door is so interesting because oh, yes. all of his study yeah. is about what is illusion and what is real. And he's made that door that looks like both halves are real and then you come up to it and only one half is real. So as I enter this house, I'm even remembered uh, or uh, reminded of his uh, philosophy. Yeah. He, the book he wrote, a first edition of it is sitting out over here. And it's called Alciphron, which is the name of one of the people in the dialogue. And Alciphron is the minute philosopher and he has seven dialogues with friends which explore these ideas of especially science and religion. Mm. Barclay did not want the two disciplines to be alienated as they sometimes are in our current civilization. So this is something people are still working with. Can you have both uh, religion and philosophy? Uh, free exploration of thinking and meaning going on at the same time, and science. 
uh, our current bishop, Bishop Nicholas Nisley in the Episcopal Church in Rhode Island, is actually exploring this topic in his sermons and is a very interesting, interesting man. And I find it fascinating to uh, hear him mm -hmm. and think about how Bishop Barclay was working with the same problems. Wow. All right. Do you have any questions at this point? No, no. But the, I think the, the coexistence of, uh, especially now with more science evolving, and we know more and more and more, I think underlying that, everyone questions. Mm -hmm. Well, why are we here? Mm -hmm. And how did we get here? And so forth. So uh, it's, it's still a, a matter of concern for people. Yes, that's very true. We're, we just, some of people need answers, want answers. So what we have here is the beginning of all sorts of discussions that still could go on today. Yeah. All right, well, let's go back to the front door. Okay. And would you like to see the garden? I'd love to. And the back of the house. Yeah. So maybe we'll go outside. Okay. It's a lovely day. Lovely sunny day. Yeah. How wonderful. Yeah. All right, Mary. Watch your step as you come out, mm -hmm. that wonderful old stone. And we'll take a little look at the garden. In Bishop Barclay's time, he probably wanted something more formal out here than what we see today. Mm -hmm. But the dames during the last hundred years have planted a garden on this side for the kitchen. Here we are in the kitchen garden, which would have been very important to the colonial housewife, not only for flavoring things, but uh, for other, other uses, uh, disguising tastes of things that were spoiled. One of my favorites here is the celery act. The, uh, it's not really celery, but it has a wonderful flavor that would have enhanced a oh, yeah. stew or yeah. uh, chicken stuffing or yeah. all sorts of things. This is lemon balm. We have lavender, which is used in cooking as well as uh, setting your linens. Thyme, mm. which is another cooking herb. You can smell a little thyme. Seasoning sure. meats, oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Sage, yeah. this is sage. Mm. This area over here is devoted to uh, housekeeping arts. And people wonder, well, what is a housekeeping art? One, uh, that plant over there with the long leaves, mm -hmm. leaves that is called Bible leaf and people would press a leaf of that in their Bible, and it would keep away bookworms. Ah. Bookworms were a problem yeah. in uh, colonial times, oh, eating the books. Mm. This, I think, is ladies' bed straw. It, they do have labels here. Um, ladies' bed straw. You could dry this and put it in a mattress and it might keep away pests in the bed. Remember um, lice. lice and bed bugs. Uh, bed bugs. Yeah. So this has a very strong scent, which is supposed to deter. It could be mixed with hay or some That's, other thing too. Fresh. Yes, but it has sort of a strong mm. aromatic. Some of these were used for dye uh, yellow loose strife was used for dyeing cloth yellow. And we'll go to the back of the house now. Well, Mary, this is the back of the house, which is 
very significant too. Some of it is slightly modernized with the modern kitchen and bathroom projecting. But it generally looked like this. And what's really remarkable is that shingle roof that goes up to the peak there, uh, which was done in the time of Bishop Barclay for the first time. You had a question about shingles? Yes, I was wondering, um, was this one of the earliest uh, uses? Of, of shingles, or, or uh, has it been used, say, in Boston um, in Plymouth? You know, it was an early building Mature, technique, yeah, and yeah. cedar is known for its wonderful, uh, long-lasting, not rotting quality. Right. Yeah. So cedar shingles are a long uh, tradition, mm -hmm. especially on the north side. Sure. This is the north side. Yeah and they do not rot like wooden siding would yeah. as quickly. Yeah. So, and they don't, the paint doesn't come off like on siding. So recently we have extended the shingles down on the north side, uh -huh. which is what you see in that McKim photograph. Right. Let me show you what's over here. We have a uh, Indian grinding stone, which indicates that this property was occupied by people for more than 1729 to 2014. Uh, this has been kept here through the years. It would have been used like a mortar and pestle, you know, to put your corn in there and grind it. And somehow this wonderful stone has survived all these years. Which brings to mind that George Barclay was very interested in the Native Americans. He probably had the concept of a noble savage, which was one of the options at the beginning uh, for how to think of the Native Americans. And he made contact with them and mm -hmm. discussed with them, their, especially their healing oh. arts. He was yeah. very curious about what, how their medicines worked. And we have evidence, he, when he went back, he wrote a whole article hmm. about an uh, article or a small book or a pamphlet about um, tar water. That was the topic of his little pamphlet. Tar water was something that was used by the local Native Americans. It's coming from uh, the pine trees, mm -hmm. maybe from maybe like turpentine or something, mm -hmm. but it was used medicinally and it was used uh, both uh, as a stomach remedy, a remedy oh. against a cancer, but also a hallucinatory uh, drug. So it is to be used what the, is still known today. It's to be used with great caution. Yeah. Yeah. But he dosed himself with uh, tar water. And, uh, you know, you'd have to talk to a medicinal person about what. That goes along with herbs and natural products being used mm -hmm. as medicines at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. But it's also that he trusted the Native Americans for information about their right. medicines and their culture. Mm -hmm. So let's now go look at this fantastic roof of shingles. And we talked a little bit that they are cedar shingles. All right, this is one of the remarkable views, and it's the view that McKim had taken in that photograph inside that helped to inspire the shingle style. Mm. And you had a question about the shingles. I was just wondering if this was a, an early example of the use of shingles, or did they use it previously, say, in Boston? Or, um, you know. Well, the, the sh Shingles are usually cedar, mm -hmm. and cedar has very <clears throat> long-lived 
properties. It lasts a long time, yeah. lasts longer than siding, which loses its paint. It, um, it, the cedar is a wood that handles wetness well, doesn't rot as easily because of the oils. So cedar was used probably from the 1600s on okay. as a building material. It also sheds the water, so it's a very, very good uh, building material. Mm -hmm. One of the nicknames for this roof is a cat slide roof, the cat having trouble holding on. Notice the two chimneys. Yeah. The front chimney for the Georgian part of the house the later addition, and the tall chimney back here for the original old kitchen okay. uh, fireplace. Right. We notice that um, the shingles now extend down onto this side. We recently did that because it's the way it is in the McKim photograph. Right. The north side, which has the most de dampness and weather uh, get the exposure sun. Yeah. Uh, will last longer if it has shingles on it. As we look at that roof, that's the roof that inspired McKim to take that photograph and inspired the colonial revival and the shingle style in America. Uh, the roof shingles become an organic skin that covers the building, is very good building material, uh, has a lot of permanence, and this really inspired them. You'll notice the two chimneys up there, the front chimney being for the Georgian addition, and the, the rear chimney being for the original dwelling, which we think was in this part the back part of mm -hmm. the, the big kitchen. house. Yes, the, the big kitchen. Yeah. Well, this concludes our tour today. Oh, gosh. Well, very, very interesting. I thank you so much. You're oh, very gosh. welcome, Mary. Oh, I, I hope, hope it, you, la it lasts for another 500 years. I hope so, Easily. too. And I hope you come back again yes. and tell your friends yeah that this is a good place. We always have parking in the summer, mm -hmm. so it's a really good place to bring your comp out of town company and is learn. Is there any way we can help support it? Yes, we have a friends group, the ah, Friends of okay. Whitehall. Yep. Uh, there's a, you know, a charge like $40 for the year, uh -huh. but then uh, yep. the, uh, there are events you can attend. Mm -hmm. Tonight we're having a reception for our visiting philosopher oh, who's nice. here at the moment. Yep. And uh, we have a Christmas open house oh. and a fall open house. Mm -hmm. I interested, I'd be interested in getting some, some brochure or some information about it. Actually. All right. I can, yes, I'll take.